Today I'm going to talk about some of the basics of cello playing, beginning with a good solid setup and then following into producing a good sound on the instrument. We'll also be talking about left hand technique and some shifting. Hopefully this provides some good information for both beginners and students who are a little more advanced. We'll start with setting up the instrument. The first and very important thing is to have the instrument set up so that the end pin is directly in line with your center. Just draw a line from about the middle of your nose and just imagine it going right down all the way through your body into the center of the floor in front of you. There should also be a lot of contact with your left knee. This allows you to be able to have a good firm grasp on the instrument that you can control with both legs. Since the um, cello leans slightly to the left side, it's best to have the contact secure with the left knee first. The right knee can really do whatever it wants without interrupting the playing. So with the end pin there and the, in, and the lower bout firmly on the left knee, the chest is the next point of contact and this one is probably the most important. When you have good posture and the instrument is resting firmly against you in, in your torso, you have complete control over the instrument without the use of your hands. This is actually really important for an unexpected reason. When you're playing with your left hand, you often have a tendency to squeeze with your thumb. This is something I've come across throughout my life and that many students struggle with. A lot of the time we pay attention to the thumb and try to force ourselves to think, don't squeeze, don't squeeze. But that actually isn't a very effective method of releasing the pressure there. What's happening when you place your left hand on the strings is that you're creating a lot of pressure right here and you'll feel resistance because the entire instrument will be pressing against you. Sometimes we avoid allowing that pressure to hit us right here and so we'll squeeze with the thumb so that we can take that off of right here because sometimes it can be a little uncomfortable. Use your chest to support the pressure of the fingers. This is something we call counter pressure and, it, and we'll use it when we get into the right hand a little bit. I've noticed that when I get nervous in performance situations, auditions or otherwise, one of the first things to go is my sense of control in my left hand. I've noticed recently that there are several ways that I've let this become a problem and it, it all comes down to how I'm holding the instrument, just the basics. So sometimes going into higher positions, I'll see students brace their arm against the upper bout like this, and that actually reduces the mobility of the left hand quite a bit. Um, if you've got that firm setup with those three points of contact and you're really allowing all the weight to go against yourself, you don't need to have your arm braced against anything. You don't need to have your thumb squeezing to get pressure down into the strings. So that's a very important principle. So with a good strong setup, you're ready to produce sound from the instrument. I'm going to talk just a little bit about the bow hold. The bow hold should be very comfortable. It should be natural and your, your fingers should be in a position very similar to what they would be if you're just holding them gently at your side. When you place them on the bow, the distance between fingers shouldn't be a stretch and it shouldn't be a squeeze like that. So not that, not that. Just, just a really relaxed, natural position. Probably the most important principle of the bow hold that I see people using ineffectively is the positioning of the thumb. The thumb should be more or less on the side of the bow and the inside of the thumb toward the tip kind of between the stick and the front of the frog right here, like that. This gives you a little bit of good contact on the side here and gives you enough here so that you can pull without falling off of the bow. A common problem I see is people reaching, students reaching underneath the stick like this. Now what that does is it creates counter pressure against the weight 
that you're trying to put into the string. You need to have your thumb free so that when you put weight into the string, it doesn't get in the way. So this holds it securely while allowing you to put weight through the string from your fingers. The fingers should rest on the stick pretty near the second knuckle, but not so near that you're grabbing it with any part of your palm. The front of the fingers should be allowed to fall forward onto the stick so that you have a lot of surface area to control the stick with. Now your fingers have this natural rubbery consistency that also provides a little bit of friction and this principle is wonderful for holding the bow. You want, you want the surface of the, of the skin to be creating a lot of the contact with the stick, not your muscles and your bones. When you squeeze too much on the bow, you lose mobility in the stick. And then you'll get that kind of sawing motion or stabbing motion. You want there to be a little bit of that natural give and take in the stroke. A good principle for making sure that happens is to only hold the bow as lightly or as firmly as the note you're currently playing demands. So if you're playing a note that's very heavy, very loud on the C string, for example, especially if you're having to change bows or play double stops, you may find that you need just a little more contact through the fingers than you normally would if you're playing something very light. So that's something that's dynamic. It's, it's always going to be changing as you're playing. There isn't one single bow hold that you find and then you have it. I think it's worthwhile also to look at some of the great cellists that you, you can find on YouTube and look at the difference in their bow holds. There really isn't one universal bow hold that every professional uses. It ends up being whatever is most natural, comfortable, and um, effective. So there are a few basic principles of holding it. For example, the placement of the thumb and the idea that you're going to be alternating between pronation, which is slight rotation in this direction, and supination, which is this way. And that happens particularly at the frog on a down bow. So pronation is probably the one that students need the most help getting comfortable with. Okay, sound production. There are three principles that govern the production of sound on the cello. The first is contact point, and contact point refers to the distance from the bridge or the fingerboard that you're that your bow is playing. There's a sweet spot on the cello where all the, uh, where the best sound comes from, and that ends up being about halfway between the bridge and the fingerboard, and then just go one little bit closer, about the, the width of the bow hair, closer to the bridge. By, by placing the bow there. So if you make that a constant, then there are, only other, there are only two other factors you need to take into account. The first is how much weight you're putting through the string and how much bow speed you're putting into the string. Now you can't have bow speed without supporting it with a, a measure of weight and you can't have weight without pulling the bow speed through. There's a range, an acceptable range, in which each note will respond. And you want to find yourself somewhere in the spectrum of that range. By doing different combinations of weight and speed, you can produce a variety of colors and volumes. I'll use this uh, simple tune as an example.
really did there was alter the amount of bow speed and weight to create a fair amount of expression. There's a little bit of timing to create that expression, but mostly it was governed by the level of volume and the different tone colors I was able to produce by altering the weight and speed. Now with a little bit of vibrato, that well-established healthy sound can be even more expressive. <laughs> vibrato, however, is secondary to what the bow is doing. All of the expression should be concentrated on through the bow. Vibrato is added. It's like seasoning to an entree. Um, Another important element of sound production involving the contact point is how much you're shortening the length of the string with your left hand. So on an open string, that position of being just slightly closer to the bridge than halfway between the bridge and the fingerboard is a good guideline. However, when you shift into higher positions, you have to move your contact point proportionally closer to the bridge to be able to maintain the same kind of tone. On the outer edges of the acceptable range of good sound production are two kinds of sounds that you'll run into that will be unpleasant and make you want to practice less. The first I call headache sound and it goes something like this. sound like that, that probably means that you're not using enough bow speed for the amount of weight that you're putting into the string. So a little faster bow and that sound will open up just a little bit or a little less weight. But it all depends on what kind of dynamic you want to play. Either way, changing the weight and the speed helps you overcome those noises and find that good balance in the middle. On the other extreme, you get the light-headed sound. Which comes from too much speed and not enough weight. By adding a little weight to that speed, sound to open up or just slow down the bow a little bit. Your bow speed has to match the frequency of the pitch that you're playing. As you go higher, you require a lot more bow speed to remain in that acceptable range. One other principle of sound production involves articulation. Every note you play has to have a clear beginning. A moment when the note begins. The easiest way to make that happen is to begin with slightly more weight than you would during the middle of the note. A good exercise is to start at the frog, pick a note, and try to create one single articulation where the note begins. So you put weight in the string, 
and then you release it into light ringing sound. Try it on the up bow too. And then do a scale. principles of left hand technique that you may run into as you're starting to play the instrument are first a hand that is too perpendicular to the strings. It's really impossible to make your hand go completely perpendicular where every single finger is at a 90 degree angle to the string. Your natural inclination is going to be to make this claw thing happen especially if you're trying to curve your fingers nicely the way you ought to. When you do this, there are four different angles to the string, and these two fingers tend to buddy up a little bit together. It has something to do with the way the tendons connect back here. I'm really not sure exactly physically what's happening there, but they do want to be together. When you hold your hand gently at your side, typically that's where they'll be, is right next to each other. So the way we avoid creating these different angles is by angling the entire hand slightly toward the bridge. In doing that, you're creating the spread of your fingers not this way, but this way. Just a slight fanning out. In reality, it's going to be a little bit of both. So as you raise your hand forward like this, your fingers naturally will be in that position. Then it's just a question of lining them up on the same string. In regard to the placement of your thumb on the string, maintain the natural curvature that happens when your palm is down at your side. If you raise that up, place your fingers so that that angle is preserved, and allow your thumb to just gently rest where it will then that'll give you a good natural left hand position. Once you have that kind of position, it's very important to remember not to squeeze with the thumb. So make sure you're sitting up straight and then tap the fingers down as you play to get used to the feeling of the weight going in and not creating counter pressure with the thumb. <laughs> becomes important when you start to play slurs that have higher notes attached to them. If your left hand fingers don't come quickly down and press the string all the way to the fingerboard, you'll run into noises like this. Those sort of in-between noises happen because the finger is not securely against the fingerboard. Particularly beginners will come across this as they're starting to play with the left hand. Sounds like that. They're not created by an error in the right hand. They're created by the left hand not being secure. Just make sure that the motion comes from pulling into the fingerboard with a little bit of finger tap rather than trying to squeeze the fingers down. Now that we've talked about tapping and smooth sound, we can talk a little bit about shifting. A common problem I see is going up into fourth position, having the hand smack against the side of the instrument. This is called the upper bout of the instrument. And when the hand smacks right there, it shows me two things. First of all, that the motion is too quick. And second, that the hand shape is not being preserved. As you shift into higher positions, the angle of the fingers and the shape of the hand should be more or less unchanged, except for those changes which are absolutely necessary because the thumb is no longer able to be underneath the neck. And you need to create some clearance here so that you can actually support a little bit of weight through those fingers. So to avoid this problem, just imagine that there's a little string on the back of your hand that's being pulled up as you shift into fourth position. This should create enough separation in your palm 
that you're not going to hit the side here. Also, don't shift too fast. Nice and slow. <laughs> A few different things you can think about while shifting. The first is how you're preparing the motion to shift. Right now I'm doing what's called an overhand shift. I'm beginning on the old finger of the shift, I'm moving on the old finger of the shift, and I've got a preparatory motion that comes in a forward arc. So it begins down. <laughs> the level of my elbow through the shift. That gives it a nice smooth movement between the two places. I think one of the reasons that we do that fast shift is because we're afraid of the friction that we have to move on if we go too slowly. But in reality you don't need to create a lot of friction as you're shifting. The string doesn't even have to be pressed all the way down to the fingerboard while you're moving. Just enough so that the sound is uninterrupted. And while you're beginning with this, don't be afraid of the noises that happen in between point A and point B. It's okay. Most of them aren't even heard in performance up to tempo. And if they are, they can be very expressive. To get this principle down first so that it's a relaxed, natural, and smooth motion is much more important than worrying about what happens in between. Another kind of shift you'll run into is an underhand shift. This one begins up high like this, and then you use gravity to just sort of slide into the note that you're going to. this kind of shift is that you will be shifting on the new finger. So a, a finger that's behind the finger you're currently playing will slide into the new position. Sometimes it can be helpful to think of two preparatory motions for this kind of shift. One to take your arm up and another To have it fall down with gravity. In both kinds of shifts, and make sure that you're preparing a little bit of forward momentum by getting a tiny back swing. If it's just directly up and down, the shift won't go where you want it to. You'll get stuck somewhere in between. It's helpful also to imagine the entire arc being traced from here, create a little mark in your mind of where you're going and draw an arc from point A to point B. That helps you with your intonation and your consistency. <laughs>